I'm Ben Mares. I'm a postdoc over at CISA. And I was asked to uh, give this talk on an introduction to cohomology. So thanks for the opportunity to speak. Um, so my idea for this is uh, that it, it doesn't seem that there are very many algebraic topologists here in Trieste. And many students come without really having uh, very much of a background in algebraic topology. And so I want this to be sort of a segue uh, for people who are maybe uncomfortable uh, with algebraic topology to get sort of a, an intuitive feel so that you can go on to uh, read some more advanced textbooks that uh, it might, at first might seem very technically daunting. Um, so one of my favorite books of all time is Bot and Two's Differential Forms in Algebraic Topology. Um, I, I would highly recommend it. And um, this talk is very heavily influenced from that. Um, so I, I don't want to really assume anything aside from some basic mathematical sophistication. Um, so what is cohomology? So for any ring R, uh, cohomology with coefficients in R uh, is going to associate uh, a smooth manifold X with a graded R algebra um, cohomology of X with coefficients in R. Am I writing big enough? Uh, besides some basic mathematical sophistication. So I'm not, I I instead of defining everything, I'm going to give some examples and uh, let people. Not necessarily. If, if you do know what these mean, then that's good. If, if you don't, then uh, you'll see some examples so that you can figure out what they mean, at least in, in, in most cases. So um, yeah, let, let me just leave it at that. And it's going to get very concrete in a moment. So what I want to do is look at the case x is CP2. So this is complex projective space. So this is the set of all triples, Z1, Z2, Z3, in uh, C3 minus 0. And this is subject to the equivalence relation uh, Z1, Z2, Z3 is equivalent to multiplying each of these entries by a non-zero complex scalar. OK. Um, so in this particular case, <clears throat> cohomology of CP2, uh, and I'm going to take with the ring R is going to be the real numbers. So CP2, cohomology with coefficients in R, this is going to be a three-dimensional three vector space. Um, and it's going to be spanned by, um, so, so this is a grading. This dot is basically a slot to indi indicate the grading. So the zero graded piece, H0, this is going to be the span of one. H2 is going to be the span of some element I'm going to call H, little h. 
and h3 is going to be the span of h squared. Hmm? Uh, th thank you, h4. And all of the other uh, graded pieces are going to be zero. Um, so this obviously has the ring structure um, uh, h, you, you have h times h equals h squared, and h cubed is equal to zero. So um, degree is going to be additive under multiplication. So you multiply two things of degree two, and you get something of degree four, and so on. Um, and the other very important property is that cohomology is a functor. So that means that if f is a smooth map between smooth manifolds x and y, this is going to induce a map f star going in the opposite direction of cohomology. And uh, identity maps are going to go to identity maps and compositions are going to go to compositions. So an important simple consequence of functoriality is that diffeomorphisms are going to uh, induce ring isomorphisms. So so let's say phi, or I, I was calling it f. So if f is a diffeomorphism, Yeah, yeah, the arrow is, yes, so the pullback goes in the opposite direction. So if F is a diffeomorphism, then F star is going to be a ring isomorphism. So this is a simple consequence of functoriality because F is a, if F is a diffeomorphism, uh, let's break this down, this means that um, uh, there exists a map F inverse such that um, F composed with F inverse is the identity on uh, Y and F inverse composed with F is the identity on X. And then you go to the ring isomorphism side, or the, the ring side, and this um, translates into um, uh, F inverse star composed with F star is the identity on H of Y. So composition, the order of composition is also going to get reversed. And uh, F star composed with F inverse star is the identity on cohomology on X. Um, okay. So what else do we have? Um, so let me think of a simple geometric example. So let's say we have a surface of genus G. So this 
looks like this in the case g equals 3. Um, if we do a reflection, reflect uh, about some point, we can or, uh, reflect about some plane, we can re uh, reverse the orientation on this surface. Um, now CP2 has this very interesting property that uh, the orientation that it has uh, cannot be reversed with a diffeomorphism. And this is going to follow from cohomology. And I'm going to explain uh, how this happens. It's essentially a consequence of this ring structure and functoriality. Um, so the point is cohomology is a very useful tool because if you want to study diffeomorphisms, diffeomorphisms, diffeomorphisms are extremely complicated. They, they form this infinite dimensional space of maps. Um, but then if you apply a functor like cohomology, that throws away a lot of information. But if you're lucky, and the relevant information remains after you've applied the functor, then you're working with a much, much simpler object, just a simple ring, which is a three-dimensional vector space over the real numbers in this case. And it's very easy to analyze, and we'll be able to see a contradiction with uh, what we're trying to show. So trying to prove that for CP2, um, uh, has no orientation reversing diffeomorphism. This would be almost impossible to show directly, but using cohomology is very simple. Um, so, uh, So let me give a proof up to a lot of details about cohomology. Unfortunately, I won't be able to fill in 100% of the details, but this should at least give you the sense of why this is true. Um, uh, by contradiction, suppose um, f maps CP2 to CP2 is a diffeomorphism which reverses orientation. This implies that F star, the induced map on the cohomology rings, this is going to be uh, isomorphism of the cohomology ring. Ah, okay. So, right. So, th th this is a good point. So, what does CP2 bar mean? So, CP2 bar has a uh, very common meaning in geometry. This is equal to uh, CP2 with, with opposite the usual orientation. So it's the bar indicates orientation reversal. Um, this also is very reminiscent of con complex conjugation. So you can take a triple in here and look at the map which sends 
z1, z2, z3 to z1 bar, z2 bar, z3 bar. This is going to be a uh, well-defined map on CP2, and it's actually going to preserve the orientation. So this is not a complex conjugation. And note, uh, complex conjugation preserves the orientation. of CP2. Thanks. Uh, are there any questions? I see some confused looks. I don't think most of the students here have to know what orientation is or what genus is or what is. Ah, OK. <laughs> so cohomology is. Yeah, this is, uh, giving a talk like this is somewhat impossible in a certain sense because uh, you really have to jump in and immerse yourself to understand everything. If I gave all the definitions, then uh, three hours later we would... Uh, yes. Yes, because I'm going to run into that... Uh, Uh, do people know what a diffeomorphism is? Is uh... okay. Well, feel free to interrupt me if. I'm 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 going to get to that. So so my idea is to start with the actual example here and see how the example works in, as an algebraic structure. So you have this algebraic structure and uh, the properties of the algebraic structure uh, give you this proof. And then once you see how the algebraic structure reflects the structure of the CP2, then we can go and try and understand how the structure is built up. So that's my plan. Okay, so, so F star always preserves the degree. So in other words, um, F star is going to map H0 to H0 h2 to h2, and h4 to h4. So f star being a ring homomorphism, so that means that you have a ring. So a ring is something with a structure of addition and multiplication, satisfying the normal rules. Um, so f star being a ring homomorphism means it's going to preserve it's going to send addition to addition and multiplication to multiplication. Uh, so in particular, um, so we have an element one, an element h, and an element h squared. And I need to tell you where these can possibly go under a ring homomorphism. So in h0, we have to have one being mapped to one. So where can we map h to? So h is going to map to something that's in the span of h. So it's going to be some uh, lambda times h for some lambda in R. So this is not going to be specified. It's going to be a parameter of the, of, of the ring homomorphism. And now h squared. Uh, maybe I should write this as 
f star of 1 is equal to 1, f star of h is equal to lambda h, f star of h squared, this, because it's a ring homomorphism, this is f star of h squared. So this is lambda h squared, which is lambda squared h squared. Mm -hmm. Why do these have to map to each other? Uh, uh, uh. Okay, so these uh, superscripts indicate the degree. So I have a decomposition of my ring into pieces of different degree. So degree 0, degree 2, and degree 4. So whenever I multiply two things, uh, whenever I multiply two things, I'm going to add the degrees. So, um, so the span of 1, this is the span over the real numbers. So this is going to be just a copy of the ring R. So in degree H0, I have just the ring R. So span of H, this is R times H. And uh, the span of H squared, this is R times H h squared. So um, if I multiply something in h2 by something in h0, this is a scalar times uh, some, fact, some, some multiple of h. That's going to go from, uh, that, that's going to end up in h2 because 0 plus 2 is 2. But if I multiply two things in h2, then that's going to end up in h4. If I multiply something in H2 times something in H4, then that has to end up in H6. And we're going to see later on that the small h is going to be represented by the Kähler form on CP2. Yeah, it's a two form. And H squared is the? H squared is going to correspond to the volume form. It, it is. Um, but uh, I, I should continue with the proof, I think. Um, OK, so there's one other thing which I haven't told you yet. And that is that an orientation of an n-manifold X is going to induce a non-zero linear map and I'm going to write this linear map uh, with the symbol of integration over X. So this is going to be very suggestive of what these objects represent. This integration over x, this is a linear map from hn of x to the real numbers. And the opposite orientation um, is going to induce So integral over x bar, where the bar represents the opposite orientation for x, this is equal to minus um, the one of the usual orientation. H squared is going to be twice the volume form. Does that make you happier? Uh, 
but it's still h squared. Yeah. Yeah. And it is the volume form. Using the wedge, wedge product. No, um, uh, the wedge square only vanishes on odd forms. For even forms, the wedge square can be non-zero. So we're, we're kind of having our own little discussion here, so I think I should. Um, um, okay. So, if F is orientation preserving, then, um, So I want to explain how uh, this integral map that is induced from the orientation uh, changes under uh, an orientation-preserving diffeomorphism. So, um, so K is going to be an element in the nth cohomology. And if I compare the integral map on K to the integral map on um, F star applied to K. These are going to be the same. Um, and if F star is orientation reversing, then you're going to have a minus sign. I can't hear you. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, yes, thank you. If the original function f, then the induced map on the ring. Uh, we don't have orientations on rings, except for uh, this is the corresponding notion for an orientation on a ring. Um, OK. so. Uh, from here, we are essentially done after a quick computation because, so for CP2, all we need to do is plug in K is equal to H squared. So if we do this, then we find that um, um, integral over x of f star of h squared, this is equal to, um, well, on one hand, we know that this is equal to um, integral over x of lambda squared f star of h. On the other hand, so, so this is using the ring homomorphism. On the other hand, we have that this is equal to um, minus 
uh, uh, sorry, h squared. Uh, h squared. On the other hand, this is equal to minus uh, h squared by the orientation reversing. So this is a linear map, so I can pull out the lambda squared and what I get is that uh, uh, lambda squared plus one times the integral of x of h squared is equal to zero. So uh, did I go too fast? So pull out the lambda squared here and then bring this to the other side. So I get one plus lambda squared times the in integral. So this means that either lambda squared plus one is equal to zero or this integral here is equal to zero. Now this can't happen because this is a non-zero linear map Uh, no, I, I can take that positive number to be one. So the induced map on, on cohomology is, I, if you think of integer cohomology, the, the real cohomology is the image of uh, integer cohomology in there. And under integer cohomology, that number is always one, for instance. Right, I, I don't have um, the arbit. I, I don't. Yeah, yeah. And in, in general, you're, you're going to get the degree as the mul multiplicative factor out there. So it's always going to be an integer. But for diffeomorphism, it has to be plus or minus one. Okay. So. Uh, because this is a non-zero linear map, and because h4 is spanned by h, h squared, the only way that this, uh, this integral has to be something non-zero. So this implies that lambda squared plus one is equal to zero for a real number, which is a contradiction. So the structure of the cohomology ring is, uh, is prohibiting a diffeomorphism which reverses the orientation. And this is, at least in my opinion, the heart of what makes cohomology a very powerful tool. Um, So maybe I should uh, reflect a little bit more on, on what this is saying. Okay, so if, so, in general, uh, be because we can divide by the integral of h squared, what, what this is saying is that um, lambda squared is equal to the integral over x of f star of h squared over the integral of x of h squared So recall that, uh, so f star is going to add a factor of h squared here, which you can pull out 
And then the denominator just cancels. So this is lambda squared, written in terms of uh, this integral here. And this is equal to uh, minus 1 if, um, if uh, f is orientation reversing. and plus one if f is orientation preserving. So the only possibilities are um, lambda is plus or minus one and f preserves orientation. So for a diffeomorphism, what you can do basically in, in terms of trying to swap the orientation, you can try and swap the sign on H. But for H squared, you can't change the sign. If, if you're doing this over the complex numbers, then this argument would break down. But because we're doing this over the real numbers, and we can do this over the real numbers because I can choose this ring to be whatever I want, then um, we have this contradiction of not being able to flip the sign. So what this is saying is that as orientation or oriented manifolds CP2 and CP2 bar are distinct manifolds up to orientation Uh, preserving diffeomorphisms. So, oh, sorry, I, are people not able to see this? So, as oriented manifolds, CP2 and CP2 bar are distinct manifolds up to orientation preserving diffeomorphisms. Um, so, strangely enough, CP2 is not the simplest example of such a manifold. Um, it's a little bit difficult to see this because this case is so, so degenerate, but um, the zero dimensional manifold consisting of a single point with some chosen orientation which corresponds to either plus one or minus one. So a positively oriented point. Uh, this has no orientation reversing. Diffeomorphism. Okay, so um, I was going to sketch the details of how um, how this ring arises from CP two. So how do you go from CP two to this ring structure? Um, so CP2 is a complex manifold this means that the tangent bundle of CP2 has an endomorphism J And this satisfies j squared is minus the identity. 
And this endomorphism is what induces the complex structure. Um, now, CP2 also has a special metric called the Fubini Studi metric. And associated, uh, this is a Riemannian metric on CP2, and it has a Levi Civita connection. And you can look at the covariant derivative of this endomorphism. And it turns out that for this special choice of metric, uh, this uh, complex structure is covariantly constant. Is it possible to say any of this in a simple setting? Just bring this in a it may not be the simplest way, but the, there, there, is, there is no especially simple way that I can think of to express this. So uh, this is just one of many ways of, of going about this. This is, uh, I think, the most concrete way of, um, I mean, if, Yeah, so it's. So I, I, I don't expect everyone to understand every word that I'm saying, but the essence of what I'm saying doesn't require uh, understanding every single word. But the, but the point is that. Um, there's something called a Kähler form. And this is very easy to define. So if G is the Fubini Studi metric, so G evaluated on two, vec on, on two vectors x and y gives the, the dot product of these two vectors. These, these are two vectors in the same tangent space. And I can act by the complex structure on one of these vectors. Um, and this is going to be anti-symmetric. And omega of x, y is defined to be uh, this anti-symmetric bilinear form on the tangent bundle. And so this H is going to be associated with omega. So uh, at a single point, omega is going to be uh, it, it's going to look something like um, uh, I, I actually I, I, I think I should uh, leave it at that for now and uh, omega squared So, so H squared is going to be associated with uh, the volume form. Okay. Um, and even more simply, one in H0, this is going to be the constant function. One. Okay, this obviously isn't a complete explanation. Um,
And then finally, uh, this linear map, which is associated with integration, this is going to correspond to integration of the volume form on, um, on, the man on, on CP2. Um, okay, so we have these three objects. I haven't really explained how you get them. Um, but you can ask, how do you know that the cohomology ring doesn't contain anything else? And um, this, again, I can't really give a complete explanation, but there's something called the Meyer Viatoris sequence. Um, so Meyer Viatoris This, um, if, if you decompose um, a manifold X into the union of two sets, A and B, this um, relates the cohomology of X with cohomologies of A, B, and the intersection of A and B. So one thing you hear in topology quite often is somebody computes the cohomology of something. And in, in my view, it's a little bit of a misnomer because you don't actually plug uh, cohomology into a formula and get an answer out uh, after, um, after doing some simple computations, but you have some relation between the cohomologies of simpler spaces and spaces that are built up from uh, patching together these more complicated spaces. And in practice, what you do in order to compute something like this um, is you take the cohomology of simpler things and inf use that to infer the um, cohomology of the lar larger things indirectly. So computation uh, of cohomology is usually very indirect. Um, so let me give some other examples. Um, So cohomology of CPN with real coefficients. This is going to be um, the ring R with a variable H uh, subject to the relation H to the N plus 1 is equal to 0. So in the case of CP2, I have the ring that's generated by H and subject to the relation H cubed is equal to zero. So I have one H, H squared, and nothing more. So in CPN, you have one H, H squared, H cubed, all the way up to uh, HN. So it's the span of 1 h, h squared up to hn. Um, it's possible to plug in um, uh, other manifolds. So cohomology of rp2, uh, let, let's say rp2n, This is the same as the cohomology of a point, which is just the span of one. So it's a very boring cohomology ring. Uh, so cohomology sometimes throws away too much information, and you lose all of the structure. Um, 
but there are ways around this. So here I'm using real coefficients. If I were to uh, look at cohomology with integer coefficients, you might think, well, the integers are smaller than the reals, so I should get some smaller answer. But it turns out that you get something bigger. So you get integers with h modulo. Um, so 2h is equal to 0. So h is a torsion element. 2h is equal to 0. And um, h to the n plus 1 is equal to 0. Oh, and uh, I, I should have said that um, the degree of h is equal to 2. The degree of h here is also equal to 2. And so in terms of the vector space, well, a vector space over a ring that's not a field is called a module. Uh, it's the same idea, though. Um, so in this case, uh, we have, it's the, this is uh, z in degree 0, 0 in degree 1, z mod 2z in degree 2, and it's going to alternate between uh, z mod 2z up until z mod 2z in degree n, and then 0 after. So the difference between coefficients in the integers and coefficients in the reals is that uh, z mod 2z, uh, this is uh, something non-trivial consisting of 0, 1. r mod 2r, well, that's 0. Um, As a final example, um, I want to consider the two torus. So the cohomology of S1 times S1 with real coefficients. This is going to be um, a ring with two variables, A and B subject to the relations um, a squared is equal to 0, b squared is equal to 0, and a times b is equal to minus b times a. So the ring is not commutative. It's actually super commutative. So Odd cohomology uh, acts like fermions, and even cohomology acts like bosons. So the product uh, satisfies the rule x times y is equal to minus 1 times the degree of x times the degree of y times y times x. So uh, x times y equals y times x unless both x and y are odd degree, in which case the sign flips. Um, yeah, so I prepared a whole lot more than this. Um, so 
I don't know what people want to do. Um, so I guess I can mention what my plan is, and depending on if people have the will or energy to actually see this, I can do it or just skip this. Um, but I was going to explain how to, um, uh, the, the simplest method of defining cohomology, which is Durham cohomology. So I was going to explain how to get this from first principles. Um, so looking at locally constant functions, um, how you're naturally led to an anti-symmetric uh, product and um, differential forms and the exterior derivative and how that naturally leads to uh, cohomology. So I'm, I'm sorry it took so long and I didn't really seem to get very far, but yeah? Yeah, uh, so probably it makes the most sense at this point to uh, take a break and uh, let people decompress a little bit and then uh, if people are still around then I can give some, uh, I can basically motivate the definition of Durham cohomology in a really slick way.